Good afternoon. I'm Leonie Watson. Uh, at the moment, I work for the Passiello Group, known as TPG. And I also work with the accessibility team at Government Digital Service on the gov.uk website. Uh, in my talk, uh, I have a number of videos. Uh, some of them are very ancient, and all of them came from uh, different sources. So uh, the sound is sometimes a little bit difficult to understand. And uh, if you happen to not have any hearing at all, uh, there are transcripts available, uh, and there is a web address for those. It is. Uh, dex, that's D-E-C-K-S, dot tink, that's T-I-N-K, dot U-K, forward slash 2017, forward slash techshare, forward slash transcripts, dot HTML. And my apologies for not having captions, but it turns out that accessibility for tools for creating captions when you haven't got sighted assistance are somewhat... Um, Absent, I think, is the phrase. So I hope this will, will enable everybody to enjoy this and understand the content uh, in some fashion. So uh, I want to talk about conversational interfaces. We've heard so much about artificial intelligence and the many technologies that we can now talk with. But what I'd like to look at is the history, what got us to the point where we're able to do this. A very light touch on some of the technologies that enable us to create conversations and then to use the inclusive design principles to take a look at how we can actually make the conversations we have with technology as usable and as realistic <coughs> as possible. So, first of all. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. And learning to talk was a truly extraordinary thing for humankind. It's enabled us to do pretty much everything that we have accomplished. It enabled us to innovate, to create, to destroy, to argue, to benefit, to love, to hate, to do all sorts of things. And it's really the thing that, above all others perhaps, has brought us to the point where we are now not just able to talk to each other, although perhaps arguably we haven't quite got the hang of that yet, uh, we are at the brink of talking to our technology. Now, it might surprise you. Uh, we've actually been trying to do this for a very long time. Uh, there are reports that actually as far back as a thousand years ago, people were thinking about uh, the concept of artificial speech. In the 1700s, uh, a German Danish scientist named Krasenstein created a mechanical device that was capable of uh, creating the five vowel sounds, A, E, I, O, and U, just by uh, passing air over some mechanical objects that were the equivalent of vocal cords. Sadly, back then, we didn't have any means of recording anything. But if we roll forward to 1939 and the World's Fair in the US, we have one of the first recordings of synthetic speech. It's called the Voda machine. The machine uses only two sounds produced electrically. One of these represents the breath. The other, the vibration of the vocal cords. There are no phonograph records or anything of that sort. Only electrical circuits, such as are used in telephone practice. Let's see how you put expression into a sentence. Say, she saw me with no expression. She saw me. Now say it in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Did she see you or hear you? She saw me. <laughs> so getting on for the better part of a century ago, there was actually some really quite remarkable synthetic speech around. In 1961, in Bell Labs, again in the United States, they took synthetic speech into what we more easily recognize today in computing. And of course, they did what we always do with technology. They tried to make it sing. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to. I'm well crazy, all for the love of you. 
And in doing so, they created one of those moments that's been re reproduced in every science fiction film to deal with AI ever since, from 2001, A Space Odyssey, through to A Theory of Everything, most recently. If we come forward to the, the 1970s now, uh, children's toys were the area where there was a lot of innovation happening in terms of talking technology. Uh, from Texas Instruments, there was a, a toy called Speak and Spell. <laughs> I was a little girl when these things were popular, and I have no idea how my parents didn't take the thing out of the window and <laughs> stomp on it, but there we go. Uh, also in the same year, 1978, uh, 2XL was a child's robot that was released onto the market. Thank you for turning me on. Let me introduce myself. I am 2XL, the smartest toy robot in the world. Now, one difference between those two examples is that the first one sounds incredibly robotic, and the second one a little bit more natural, the quality of the sound notwithstanding. And the reason is because the second one fakes it. It's actually a human recording inside the, the robot toy, whereas the first one is actually properly synthetic speech. And that's a theme we see now, even today, in, in the way we develop and create synthetic voices. In 1984, we saw one of the first text-to-speech engines coming about, ones that are very familiar to those of us who use screen readers. It was the DeckTalk speech synthesizer. I am Perfect Paul, the standard male voice. I am Beautiful Betty, the standard female voice. Some people think I sound a bit like a man. <laughs> And I love that quote because, again, we're seeing one of the themes coming through that we, we have now in conversational interfaces. That element of humor, because that's so real to people, uh, we see that emulated time and time again as a way of making conversational interfaces seem more realistic. Uh, in 1984, something else happened. Uh, Apple released the Macintosh. And in doing so, Steve Jobs did quite a remarkable thing in the official launch event for the 1984 Macintosh. Now, we've done a lot of talking about Macintosh recently, but today, for the first time ever, I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. When it comes as I am to public speaking, I'd like to share with you a match and I saw the, the first time I met an IBM mainframe. Never trust a computer you can't with. With apologies to everyone here from the IBM team, of course. <laughs> Uh, Apple, in 1993, actually uh, started turning their attention to the other half of the conversation, uh, getting humans to talk to technology. Macintosh, open letter. Macintosh, print letter. Macintosh, fax letter. While everyone else is still trying to build a computer you can understand, Macintosh, shut down. We've built a Macintosh that can understand you. Goodbye. And if nothing else, that's Apple marketing at its best. By my recognition, it took another 15 years before I had anything like that kind of a conversation with technology. <laughs> uh, in 1997, Dragon, naturally speaking, released the first of the well-known uh, speech recognition systems used by... Uh, in the early days, mostly the medical and legal professions, but now, of course, by many people who are unable to use traditional input devices for computers and other technologies. This is Dragon Naturally Speaking, comma. Speech recognition software that turns your voice into text three times faster than typing, with up to 99% accuracy, period. And again, another triumph for marketing, I have to say. I tried using Dragon not long after it was first released, and it was a painful experience having to train it to understand my voice, having to talk in my very best BBC tones to make sure it understood me, and all the rest of it. And again, you know, it took a long time, I think probably a decade before that really changed in terms of conversational interfaces. And the thing that really did it, at least in my book, was Apple's Siri when it came along in 2011. 
Suri, where can I find something to eat? There are 25 Chinese restaurants located on Spadina. I don't want Chinese food. Sorry, I thought that was all you ate, Mad Chin. Fine. Where's the closest one? And for the first time, we could have something that felt a lot more like having a conversation with the technology. In 2014, we saw Microsoft's Cortana <coughs> arrive on different versions of the Windows operating system. And we had at our disposal another digital assistant we could talk to and that would talk back to us. Hey, Cortana. Guess what? There are 2,335,981,212,665 possible answers to that question. <laughs> And again, that element of humor coming through. Uh, 2014 also saw the introduction of the Amazon Echo that we've heard about a great deal today. And uh, we started to see digital assistance being used for much more practical things uh, in the house because it wasn't really attached to a device you needed to get your hands on in any fashion. Alexa, what is the forecast for Seattle, Washington? Right now in Seattle, Washington, it's 44 degrees with showers. Tonight's forecast has rainy weather, with a low of 39 degrees. Alexa, set a timer for five seconds. Five seconds, starting now. But all of these things are still very well structured. To get the jokes, you have to ask these things very specific questions. Uh, to get it to do things, you have to uh, ask very specific and carefully phrased commands. But uh, Google Now, in 2015, uh, made their devices context-aware. So you didn't always have to refer to the thing you wanted to ask about by name. So you want to see it in action? Yes? All right, let's do it. So here he's listening to Skrillex. And you wonder, like me, what is his real name? OK, Google, what's his real name? Skrillex's full name is Sunny John Moore. Who knew? Actually, I was wondering who Skrillex were, but there we go. <laughs> but the interesting thing there is, is that when he asked the, the, the Google Assistant the question, he didn't have to say, what is Skrillex's real name? He just said, what is his real name? And it picked it up because of the context of the music playing in the background. So context awareness adds a really human dimension to our conversations. So we have to think about speech. It's an incredibly powerful thing. As I said at the beginning, we use it to amuse each other, entertain each other create affection, dislike, hatred, fear, all sorts of different things. It's a very versatile tool that we have at our disposal. It's also very strange. Uh, we use idioms in language that are difficult for people to understand. It's raining cats and dogs. Literally, really. Uh, we use language that's based on the context that we're in. You might be in a cafe and say, uh, I'd like a coffee to go. That only really makes sense if you happen to know you're in the context of a cafe. Uh, we use slang. In Britain, we say a couple of quid instead of uh, two pounds. Uh, we also have different regional variations. Uh, where I come from in Bristol, uh, we might say, all right, my baba. But somewhere else in the, in the country, they might say, you like pet? Is it OK? We have different terms of affection for each other, and we use different words to describe the things that we're talking about. Speech isn't always needed, of course. We quite often use gestures to communicate some information. A shrug of the shoulders and a turned down mouth means, well, I don't know. Or we just uh, point to something and say, it's over there. Never fails to amaze me how many people do that to me as a blind person when I ask them something. Where is it? Oh, it's behind you. Over there. Oh, great, thank you. It's like the pantomime season. So we have, to, we have this challenge. Uh, we have to make the synthetic speech sound human. And that means it has to be understandable. It has to be intelligible. You've got to be able to, to identify the words. But it also has to be natural as well. In terms of actually creating the voices, we have different techniques for doing it. Uh, we have formant synthesis, and this is entirely synthetic speech. Uh, this is the uh, type of speech synthesis that's used for some of the very robotic voices we've heard today. Uh, it's very quick, it's fast, and it's responsive. That's why you'll find a lot of people, myself included, still tend to prefer the old school text-to-speech engines with their screen readers, because they're just damn quick. They sound terrible, but they're really, really responsive. So they sound perhaps a little bit like this. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened that unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. So it's 
intelligible to me because I'm used to listening to that thing, but I remember the first time I heard a screen reader talk and I nearly fell over. It was blimey, really? More recently, we've had concatenative synthesis where we record tiny little chunks of a real human voice and we stitch them together to create the words and phrases that we actually want the conversation to say out loud. This is the sort of technology that uh, is used on the voices that Siri uses, for example. And it sounds something like this. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals. Then something happened that unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk. So it's still a little bit robotic, um, but more natural than the form and synthesis-based technologies. What's recently arrived on the scene is something called parametric synthesis, which is entirely synthetic again, but it uses very heavy computational models to set parameters and do the thinking uh, to produce much more realistic voices. Uh, last year, this was a technology that was still being developed, uh, notably by Google uh, and their DeepMind division, and it still required huge amounts of processing. But this year, uh, Google actually translated this technology into all of its Google Assistant devices. And of course, we did that thing we always want to do. We decided to make it sing. Never had much faith in love or near of those. Never wanna put my heart on the line. Which is really quite extraordinary for, for those of us who've been listening to, to the other kinds of voice over the years. So how do these work under the hood? What are the technologies involved? Uh, there is uh, the voice XML uh, markup language. This is the technology that is used on all of those dreadful telephone menu systems that we all absolutely loathe, but which organizations seem forever attached to having. Uh, it's a way of structuring a conversation, um, marking up chunks of speech into words and phrases uh, that can be used as, as part of a conversation. We also have speech synthesis markup language. Uh, like voice XML, it's a technology from the W3C. It's been around since about 2004. And this lets you add characteristics to speech. It lets you change volume, speed, pitch, all of those different characteristics. If you're really curious, it's a speech synthesis markup that is used on uh, Amazon Echo devices to create the conversational uh, interfaces. If we look at the web specifically, there is something called the CSS speech module. It's been around for many years, originally as oral style sheets. And its intention is to let web developers create oral designs for websites, as well as the more conventional graphic designs. Uh, Safari and iOS and VoiceOver has a support for a very little bit of this particular specification, but it hasn't really had any other adoption uh, across the marketplace. But we can team it up with another uh, technology on the web, which is the uh, speech synthesis interface. Uh, and that lets you turn web applications into things that you can talk to and that can talk back to you. So in theory, if you wanted, you could create a speech recognition or a screen reader tool that sits in the browser using these technologies. Also, that's probably uh, not something terribly necessary to do. Uh, we can put these two together, though. Um, we can see how the CSS might be used to design the oral experience of visiting a website uh, by giving it speech using the Web Speech API. And it goes like this. This sounds normal. This sounds loud. This sounds quiet. This sounds fast. This sounds slow. This sounds high. This sounds low. So we have technologies at our disposal that we can use to make conversational interfaces in the browser. But uh, from now, I'm going to return back to the more uh, sort of recognized native devices, the, the, the home assistants, the, the mobile phones and use the inclusive design principles from the Pesiello group and many of our friends in the accessibility community. Uh, we took, um, took accessibility thinking, if you like, uh, into uh, what's known as inclusive design because we wanted people to think about accessibility outside of disability. Uh, you know, having more time to do something, for example, is a huge accessibility benefit if, for whatever reason, you are slower at interacting with your technology or you need more time to think or hit buttons or frame phrases. But actually, it's very useful for everybody else as well. If the doorbell rings and you're in the middle of a task, for example, uh, you're just distracted by the children running in and wanting to know where something is. There's a whole bunch of reasons why accessibility is good for everybody. And so these principles try to frame it within that kind of context. 
So the first one is providing comparable experience. Uh, make sure that when we design conversations, uh, we're providing a comparable experience for everyone. Now, there's a basic problem with conversational <coughs> interfaces, and that's that they require speech and they require hearing. So when we think about comparable experiences, we need to think particularly about addressing those particular things. One way we can do it is to provide conversational transcripts. Most of these devices either have a screen themselves or have a second screen or an app that accompanies them. And in almost every case, it's possible to put a transcript of the conversation onto that screen. So if someone can't hear the conversation, they can at least read it from an app or a little screen on the device. Overcoming the speech interaction side of things is a bit more challenging. I'm not sure that there are any answers to how you interact with a conversational interface other than through some technology like that that Stephen Hawking uses, uh, which can simulate speech for you. But within the devices themselves, at the moment, I'm not aware of any technologies that assist that particular kind of hurdle. Uh, we need to consider situation. Uh, people will use conversational interfaces in different situations. So we need to keep it simple, because somebody might be driving or concentrating on the cooking when they want a, an update from a recipe. Whatever we do, we have to keep it simple for a whole bunch of different reasons. So we don't want to do something like this. Uh, we don't want to say, have the user say, open my tequila app. And for the app in response to say, opening the tequila app, what now? She says, using a gesture <laughs> to communicate. There's no cue there. There's no uh, indication to the user how to continue that conversation. So we've just dead-ended it. Instead, what we want to do is have the user open the app. And for the app to say, uh, You've opened the tequila app. You can learn about Joven or Reposado or Blanco tequila. Which one would you like? And the user instinctively then completes the conversation by indicating which tequila they would like to learn about. So we've, we're off the starting blocks. We, we've created a conversation, and, and we've got it off to a good start. Uh, we need to be consistent, uh, use common words and phrases. This is where the context awareness really comes into play, because uh, some of the ways we've had to interact with technology at a conversation level has been very forced, but using context is one technique that helps it feel more natural. There are other things we can do, though. Uh, we don't want to make people use unfamiliar language. So we wouldn't want to have a user say, uh, flight status app, what is the state of flight XYZ 1050? And for the app to turn around and say, the status of flight XYZ 1050 is that it has a fault GP37Y, and the point of departure has been delayed to 0330. What? Really? Uh, what we want is to be able to say to the app, hey, what's the status of my flight to Amsterdam? And for the app to come back and say, your flight to Amsterdam has been delayed because of a mechanical fault, but it'll now depart at 330. Because that's a whole lot easier to pass. Whatever you're doing, that's a lot more understandable, both to interact with and listen to. We want to give control. Uh, we want to give people uh, information in small chunks in conversations, and we want to give them the opportunity to decide where the conversation will go. So we don't want to do things like, uh, tea shop app, what's the most popular tea? And for the app to come back and say, there are lots of popular teas. Number one is English breakfast. Number two is Darjeeling. Number three is Assam. Number four is Earl Grey. Blah, because by the time it's got to the end of the list, I don't know about you, I've pretty much forgotten what's at the top. What we do want to say is, hey, what are the most popular the teas? And for the app to say, the most popular is English breakfast. Would you like to hear some more? And we then have the choice. Yes, please. In which case, the app can tell us about the others. Or, no, thank you. I've got the answer I wanted. Let's go off into the conversation in a different direction. We do need to offer choices, though. Uh, we don't want to offer too many choices, but when we do, we need to keep it simple. So we don't want to do things like, uh, app, I'd like to order a milkshake. <laughs> and for the app to say, yes, you can order a milkshake. There is chocolate, banana, and strawberry, and peanut butter. And for chocolate, say chocolate. For strawberry, say strawberry. For vanilla, say vanilla. And for peanut butter, say vanilla. <gasps> right. What we do want to do is, like we've seen before, hey, app, I'd like to order a milkshake. Uh, there is, and for the app to say there are chocolate or strawberry, or there are other flavors, which would you like? And at that point, we can choose, uh, I'd like to hear about some more. And it can say, well, there's also vanilla and peanut butter. And then we're in the conversational place to be able to say, thanks, uh, I'll make a decision. I'd like peanut butter, milkshake, also, why would you? Um, we need to prioritize content. Uh, 
when we are scanning through something that has some sort of visual or tactile interface, uh, most of us have methods for quickly scanning or recalling how that interface is, you know, what content is available, what choices are shown. Conversationally, we don't have that. We've got to deal with what the human memory can cope with. Uh, so we need to help make that easier in conversation too. So we don't want to do things like, uh, I'd like to open my recipe app. And for the recipe app to come back and say, well, you can read a recipe, edit a recipe, delete a recipe, change a recipe, or do something else. Again, we want to keep it simple. Uh, hey, app, open my recipe app. And for it to say, do you want to find a recipe or something else? Because finding a recipe is probably the most likely thing that someone's going to want to do with this particular app in that particular scenario. And again then, give the user choices about which way they want the conversation to go and lots of information in smaller chunks. Uh, we need to add value. Uh, we need to think about adding features to our conversations and how much value they add different people in different ways. So. <coughs> One thing we need to do is remember that we are dealing with something that is essentially a non-visual uh, interaction. So when you write or develop conversations, don't think about how something looks on paper and how your brain would translate that into speech. You have to think about how it's actually going to sound in conversation. So for example, if we asked a sports app what the score of the current Bristol game was, if we wrote it down, it would probably look something like Bristol 35, 20 Harlequins. Uh, there is 0, 30 of uh, an hour left to go. Now on print, if you're used to reading uh, sports fixture scores, our brains translate that into something approximating sensible information. But actually, we need to do that as part of the conversation. So actually what we need to say in response to that question is that uh, with 30 minutes to go, uh, Bristol is leading 35 to 20 against the Harlequin. We need to write the conversations exactly as though we were having them in person. Uh, one we have to think about is privacy. Uh, we can't talk to our technology very privately, either because we're in the middle of the kitchen, the middle of the office, the middle of the train station. So we have to think about uh, alternative ways of conversing with these technologies or how they work when we need privacy. Uh, it got mentioned earlier today, we have to think about security. How do we make sure that the exchanges we have with these technologies are kept secure, it can't be hacked? How do we protect our data and the systems within our lives that are connected to these technologies? How do we deal with recognition and identity? Is voice recognition accurate enough or reliable enough as a means of securing someone's identity? What about the people for whom speech is difficult, impossible, or it varies a lot because at different times of the day they are perhaps more tired and their voice changes? What do we do about trust? What happens if this technology, speaking technology, becomes so human, so accurate and realistic that we instinctively place far more trust in it than we should? One article I read about this said, imagine if your child had a teddy bear that had artificially intelligent, speech-driven characteristics. And it became your child's best friend in the way that toys often do. But then suddenly, after a few months of owning it, the teddy bear suddenly said, you know what? I really like my best friend teddy bear to come and live with us. You can buy them at XYZ toy shop for only $1.99. I'd be so sad without my best friend teddy bear. And we know what pester power is like. It's quite bad enough already. But what's going to happen when we, we instinctively place trust, perhaps too much trust, in these technologies because they become so realistic, so easy to trust? So lots of things to think about. As I say, it's been a million years since, uh, well, not quite a million years, a million years before we learned to talk. It's been a few thousand since we did. And now we're entering an era where we can talk with technology. So we have a lot to think about. but. I don't know about you, I think it's an extraordinarily exciting time and I hope we have a lot of fun while we're doing it. Thank you. Great.